it's peach season. So this past weekend, a few days ago, got a bunch of peaches. Uh, these are from our local orchards. Nice and fresh. Some of them are quite ripe. Going to get them on the freeze dryer trays and into the freeze dryer. Right now, I don't have anything on the trays, so I'm going to go ahead and load them onto the trays and put them in the freeze dryer, not frozen. I will put them into the freezer, the regular freezer, to wait until I have all the trays ready to go. So three of them will have been in the freezer for a little while before the fourth tray is done, and then it'll go right into the freeze dryer. So let's get them started. So start by blanching them to remove the skins, because I don't like the skins of peaches when they're freeze dried. If I were just going to eat it like this, I don't have a problem with the skins. But freeze dried, I found it really terrible. So let's go. Okay, I just put them in there for one minute. I'm going to check to see if that was long enough. If they're fairly ripe, then a minute's more than enough. If they're not as ripe, then it sometimes takes a couple minutes. Okay, turn that down. Oh yeah, now I remember the other part. It's been a long time since I've done peaches. I'm supposed to have crossed that a little bit first. And then this will peel right off. So these are really nice. Those are peeling excellently. Okay, and then I'm going to slice them. Um, get those out of the cold water. Grab the edge of the peel. Again, it would have been better if I'd remembered to put the marks on it. Cut them partly first, so I'll take care of that on the next ones. Hmm, these are going to stick together. So the problem I see with these, with all the sugary juices, these are going to stick together like crazy and be one big blob. So I better put them um, not touching. I'm going to leave these this way, but then I'll leave the other ones more spread apart. So on future ones, I will pre-freeze them on the cookie sheets so then they can touch because they won't be stuck together already. Okay, and... Okay, takes less than a minute and they'll be ready. Remembering to put that little score in there, then they start to peel open right away. And that's what I forgot to do the first set. Well, it's been a year since I've done peaches. <laughs> so in the rest of this tray, I'm going to put them a single layer, not touching. Because I forgot about the whole sticking together thing. So I'm putting them pretty thick slices, about a half inch. And then I'll do single layer. Okay. So that's how I'm going to go ahead and do these. And future ones, well, after this batch, I'll do them on the cookie sheets again so that they're like this. And then I can put them on the trays and really load them up in even a double layer if I want. I'll show a little bit more, I think, but basically we'll come back when these are complete and ready for the freeze dryer. That's what the other trays are going to look like. It's peach season. So these are the first peaches that we've had of the year, uh, except for we had a few little ones off of our tree that I planted a year and a half or so ago which of course I should have stripped all the peaches off for the first year because you should let the tree grow stronger. But, you know, I just couldn't resist to have a few of them. So have a dozen or so off of that. And they're pretty small. So we'll get this first batch of peaches in there and it's going to be a little bit light because I put them directly onto the freeze dryer trays. The next ones I will be pre-freezing on cookie sheets. Then I'll be transferring them onto the freeze dryer trays uh, when they're already frozen as individual pieces. That way I can kind of stack them and I, I can go double high on them so I can get a bigger batch in there. At least I think that's what I want to do. So let's get these weighed and in the freeze dryer. The freeze dryer has been running the whole time that I was prepping this batch of peaches so that I'd make sure that it is cold since the peaches aren't all the way frozen yet. Tray one, 1427. And I'm gonna try to get a thermometer in these because nothing's very frozen yet, so it should go right in. 
and I want something inside those tray two. 1439. Just kind of checking to see which one's far enough away for my purpose. Tray three, which was the first one we filled actually. 1465. And even with that stacked up that way, it's still not very much heavier than the others. I'm going to go ahead and turn it and stick this in between the layers of peaches on this side. And tray four is the last one to go in there. 1389. Where do I want that one? Oh, let's try there. I'm going to go in here. And as I've said many times, thermometers are not necessary for freeze drying. But I consider it perhaps my second most important tool after the scale for freeze drying. Let's go over and get them in the freeze dryer. That's a beautiful set of peaches. Let's get them in there before they warm up at all. We'll start at the bottom and work our way up. So tray four. I've got a good seal ring all the way around this time. Uh, and it helps when it's pre-cooled like that because then it kind of sucks it shut as the air condenses in there. I'm going to make sure I give this a good long freeze, a lot longer than I usually do because I usually do everything completely pre-frozen. This isn't pre-frozen. The coldest one was only 20 degrees. The other one was 40 degrees. And peaches, they freeze below normal freezing point of water because of all the sugars. So. We'll be back in about two days and check these out. And in the meantime, we'll process the other peaches on some trays and then transfer them to just Ziplocs ready to pour onto the trays. We did seven cookie sheets full of the slices. So now we're gonna transfer them to giant zipper bags and put them back in the freezer to await their turn in the freeze dryer. And because peaches are so sugary, they stay a little bit flexible even when they're frozen at regular freezer temperatures because these were nice and ripe. And I do want to kind of pop them apart if I can so that they're ready for the trays, but maybe I should just leave them like this and chuck them on trays. Anyway, so I want to handle them as little as possible, so I'll probably leave them pretty big chunks. And I'm not sure how we're going to put them on the freeze dryer trays yet. I don't know if we'll layer them uh, or shingle them or exactly what. And this is the one that I ran out of the sill pads, so had to use parchment. I used two layers of it to help make sure that it wouldn't get stuck to the pan. Yeehaw! That goes back into the freezer to wait its turn. We'll see those again when it's their turn in the freeze dryer. The freeze dryer finished a few minutes ago, about 15 minutes ago. And if it weren't for the fact that I have thermometers in the food, I wouldn't take them out for the weight check right now because I wouldn't be able to know how long it's been off on my machine. And therefore I wouldn't know how cold the food was. It's still about 60 degrees on the trays, so they're still good to take out. According to the machine, they should have been taken out and they should have been done last night. They've had about another 10 hours since then. Uh, I checked them last night and one of the thermometers, the one that I have in the thicker area of peaches where I kind of shingled them on the trays, so the first part that I put out, it was much colder. It still said it was only 40 degrees when the other trays said that they were about 100. And that's what I mean by the machine is easy to fool. So the one area probably wasn't dry. The rest of the whole load may have been dry, but I loaded it unevenly. And when you load it unevenly or with different materials on the trays, the machine cannot tell whether everything is dry. It can tell whether or not the pressures and temperatures are in the parameters that it thinks it's dry. But it's easy to fool or lie to. And that's essentially what I did by having one small area much thicker. So everything else was probably dry. And so it couldn't drive the pressures up high enough for the machine to go, hey, I'm still not done. So it said, hey, I am done. And it was mostly done. 
let's get them out, weigh them, put them back in for the weight check. So I don't have to bypass any time because I'm late. So I'll open the drain valve. And as soon as the pressures are equalized, we can open the chamber. And tray one. And the tray is definitely cold. I would be concerned about taking them out and bagging them right now because they are cold. I will rotate the tray positions again. So tray two, 859. Oh, that's pretty interesting. Okay, then I'm going to put tray one down a spot and tray up. Tray two will go up a spot. Okay, tray three, 857. And that's the ones I was talking about, the double layer here or the shingle stacked ones. This makes it this thick instead of way down here. So these took longer to dry, of course, because it's much thicker. And I wanted to find out. Oh, actually, those came apart quite nice. I thought they were going to be really, really stuck. That's why I didn't put them on there that way. Well, shucks, if I'd have known that, I would have loaded all of the trays like this and gotten much more on there. Oh, well. I really thought that the sugariness was going to keep them stuck completely. Those are coming apart very nicely. Well, live and learn. Okay. Tray four. And that tray is positively cold. 855 or four. And now put this back in up a spot and this tray is icy cold. The food is still 55 degrees. The other one's 65, 60, about 64. But the tray is so cold that I would get condensation on the bottom layer of the food where it's touching that tray because that layer is cold. And I would never bag it if there could be condensation. And with the drain valve closed, we'll add more dry time. Close the drain valve. It's a good thing it reminds me. Continue. And I'm not worried about the pump cooling. That means the pump has been off for a half hour, and the, so that's been cooling off for a half hour. So far too long to take them out without it being in danger of condensation on the trays. Okay. And I'll give this three hours in case I can't make it back in time. If I do, I can lower it back down to two. I like two hours to be kind of my minimum dry check. That allows it to get up to temperature for the pressures to get low and for any moisture in there to start sublimating again. But because the ice layer, if there's any ice or moisture, is going to be at the center of the layer of food, it takes time for that heat to migrate through to there. So I like to have a minimum of two hours. If it's a thicker block, I would go a minimum of three or four hours. There's really no problem going too long. There's just a danger of not going long enough. So we'll come back in two or three hours and check it. So don't go away, it'll be just a second. And I'm back. It's been just a little over two and a half hours uh, since we put them back in there for the weight check. Now we'll take them out and weigh them to see if they lost any weight. If they didn't lose any weight, then we'll take them out and bag them. So we'll bypass the rest of that time. We'll open the drain valve. And as soon as the pressures are equalized, we'll get it open. Starting at tray one. And that's a very toasty tray right now. It did not cool down or have a chance to cool down. Before it was at 865 and dropping down to 864. Now it's a solid 864. So I don't think it has made any change. Let's check the others. A tray two. Okay, no change. 
and tray three. This was the one that was thicker, that I was more concerned about. Make sure it doesn't touch, of course. No change. And tray four. And again, very toasty and no change. We're gonna go ahead and take them out, get the time and the power usage in just a minute. In the meantime, we'll get it turned off with no defrost. Make it so much quieter. The time on my display is showing just about 51 hours, but it did not take 51 hours. I had added additional time last night when I saw that the thermometer on one of the trays was still low and I bumped it up to 44 hours. So 44 hours looks like what it took to dry that batch. And most of the trays were probably less. It was the one that was thicker. And this next batch is going to be a heavier batch. It's going to have a double layer on almost everything. So it will take a longer amount of time. It might take 50 hours or more because I'm loading it up and the temperature right now is hot. It's been very hot here for the last couple of weeks and my basement has not cooled down at night like it usually does. So this is the hottest I think my basement's ever been. It's over 75. It might go as high as 80 part of the day, which is just scorching for our basement because usually it's below 70. So we're supposed to get some more cool weather and we'll be able to cool it down at night again. Anyway, and that makes a difference though. If your temperatures are higher where your freeze dryer is, it's going to take longer. If you can keep it cool all the time, it will go faster. If I could move this up into my garage, which is air conditioned, it would be faster, but I can't move this thing up there. So we'll use 44 hours as the, how long did this batch take to freeze dry? Now, the power usage. So the power meter is showing 74.77 kilowatt hours, but I know this batch was nowhere near that. Uh, the problem is I forgot to reset it after the last batches. So now I do not know the amount of power for that. That amount of time would typically be about 35 kilowatt hours, but I don't know on this one. So I will just put 35 and a question mark. And then I'll reset it this time, so the next one I will have the information. I'll put my little defrost baffle into place. And get my fan in. As soon as that's defrosted, we'll get the next batch in. Or more likely, I'll wait until tomorrow morning so that I don't have to get it going uh, tonight. I'm going to do two batches. One in my sister's machine and one in my machine at approximately the same time with approximately the same weight of fruit in them. So we'll see that on the next one. For now, let's go over to the bagging. Now we'll get the thermometers out of these and get them weighed and get the final weights. And these really came apart pretty nicely. And they're probably not going to be quite as brightly colored as they could have been because I didn't put any ascorbic acid or fruit fresh or anything on them before I freeze dried them or before I froze them. So they may have darkened a little bit, but not bad. Tray one and we'll get the thermometers out and they kind of stuck. So those will of course have to be washed off, but that's true with every batch. And that's 856. Tray two, 850. I think you can hear the machine starting to pop already. 848 and 846. So we'll subtract all the tray weights and paper weights and we'll get the total and then figure out how much we're going to be able to fit in a bag. So, so far all I have is the quart bags with the batch number on it. And then as soon as we get the weights and figure out how much will fit, we'll print the tags. So I got the math kind of worked out for this one. We got the date that it went in, got the batch number and what it is, and the fact that they were not pre-frozen, which takes a lot of extra time. Usually with pre-frozen batches, my freeze time in the freeze dryer is six hours or less. And this I had 11 hours of freeze dry time, or freeze time. Because of the sugariness of the peaches, I wanted to make sure that they really had a chance to get good and hard and cold because the freezing point of the sugary stuff is lower than normal freezing of water. 
Anyway, then I've got the gross weight of each tray before uh, they were freeze dried. I've got the tear weight of the, so the tray and paper weight, and then what it was before. So before it was freeze dried, this batch was only about six pounds, so just barely over six pounds. After freeze drying, I did the same thing, and the total is 409 grams, which is about 0.9 pounds. Uh, so to bag them in one pound bags, I need 68 grams of peaches in a bag. I don't know if that's going to fit. That means I would only have six bags, and that seems unlikely that it's going to fit. So I've also calculated out for three quarters of a pound and a half pound. So first, let's do a test, see what will fit in the bag before we print the labels. And I'm using the gusseted bottom 7 mil bags. I really like those. Get that zeroed out. And you certainly could bag in bigger bags, then you'd need less bags. But most of the time, we find that this is about what we want at a time. And I need to kind of loosen these up still because of the sugariness, they really stuck together. But they come apart real well. I was afraid they were going to be stuck a lot. Find out how much will fit in one of these. Well, wow. okay, so that's just over a half pound right there. I think I can get three quarters of a pound, but I'm pretty sure I can't get a pound. So I'd need 51 grams. Okay. So there's three quarters of a pound, and that seems to fit real nicely. I can still close it. It's going to be able to zipper. So I'm going to go with three quarters of a pound per bag. So I'll get the labels printed next and get them attached. And figure out how many labels we need. So if we have three quarters of a pound, and six pounds. So we need eight labels and eight bags. And I have six so far, so I'll get two more bags. And we'll get the batch number on the bag. 637. And I'll get this poured back out so I can get the label on the bag when it's flat. Now I can get them bagged. So now I have my batch number and then all the information on the label. And if the label falls off, dies, fades away, whatever, I still have this batch number to refer back to and with my notebook. And I keep a hard copy of everything, including the location of all my bags, because that way, if for whatever reason my computer fails, I don't have any power, whatever, I can still look at it on the hard copy. I do have most everything on the computer, but I like the hard copy too. We're after 51 grams per bag. There we go. That's pretty close. So again, we're going to kind of average 51, so some might be a fraction under, some a little over. Okay, so this one is slightly heavy. And that's a good thing. That means we've got a couple of pieces that we can snack on. So, all right, 51. Two extra pieces out of that whole batch. Snack time. And they came out pretty well, even with no fruit fresh on them or ascorbic acid. It would have been nice if I'd done that. You can see how it uh, got a little bit more brown on there. But they'll be fine, and they're not going to change from this point. Peaches again, are like ripe pears. They, they are not super crisp and crunchy. They're just very, very dry. So if you press on them, you can kind of squish them like a piece of styrofoam. But if you twist them, then they'll snap apart. So now we'll get the oxygen absorbers in those and get them sealed. So I'm going to use the 300 cc oxygen absorbers as usual. And I've got one bag that only has six, so I'll use that up first and then open a new bag to get the last couple of them, and then reseal it. So then I'll mark it the fact that I took two out and that there's eight left. Okay, I'm going to tuck these down the sides. Make sure they stay out of that zipper area. Okay, and then before I get the other ones, I'll go ahead and zipper these shuts. And because these are pretty full, I'm just kind of pulling 
it'll part from the middle or from the two sides and then getting the zipper done. So I've already marked that there's going to be eight left in this one. I'll get two of them out of there. You can see the sensor turns blue or purple or whatever very quickly and it will turn back to the salmon color over the next few hours. I've got that resealed and ready for the next time. Then we'll get these sealed and I'm sealing them as high up on the bag as I can in case I mess it up and need to do it again. Okay, and doing the first one twice to make sure it's all the way up to temperature. I've got a good seal high up on there in case I either have a bad seal or if I want to cut it off, use part of it and reseal it. Okay, we'll get all of those done real quick. Oh, that one, I had too much of an angle. It did not get the full seal. So I'll go back, push it up in there a little bit further and do it one more time. This has a five millimeter wide seal strip. I want to make sure I get all five millimeters. And you can even go twice and get 10 millimeters to do it double wide. And I know some of the machines, some of the sealers have an eight millimeter sealer. And then adding that one more thing that we like to add, and that's the gross weight of each bag. This bag, as it sets, weighs 74 grams. I'm going to write 74 grams on the bottom corner of that. So that way, in case something goes wrong with that bag, if it's a bad bag and starts letting moisture in, or if I get a puncture in it and it starts letting moisture in, uh, double check that. If it's bouncing between two numbers, I'll take the higher number. If I've done the freeze drying poorly, then this won't help at all. This won't tell you anything because this is just telling you is something getting in or out of that bag. So if it gets heavier, I will know that I've got a bad bag in some fashion. So it's got a hole in it and moisture is leaking in. Those are ready to put on the storage shelf now and I'm not sure where they're going right now. So uh, I'll probably do that later. Don't know if I'll show that. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more peaches.